aging friendly communities is sponsored by the APA private practice division and it's really tied into a divisions council initiative the divisions council is a component of APA and it's comprised of 20 what we call divisions and these divisions are really professional peers um, affinity groups around urban design technology and in our case it's private planning or private practice I have also uh, identified the um, website for the Divisions Council initiative. It's on aging and livable communities. The goal of this initiative is really to provide a robust uh, information and database, an opportunity for planners to be able to help in the transformation and the creation of communities that are livable for all. And so by providing these resources, it will help planners, um, people interested in improving their communities, to be able to address the aging of the baby boomers and the aging, what I call aging tsunami, as you can tell, I'm from Hawaii. And the aging tsunami is really the doubling of the older population by 2030 from about 34 uh, million to over 70 million. I'm Ramona Malahi and I'm the chair of the Private Practice Division and I'm your moderator today. And we have some really wonderful speakers. Um, our first speaker is Amanda Lenin. Um, she is currently an NIA postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. This past May, she received her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, where she did a dis dissertation focused on local government policies and programs that can help older adults age in place. Um, Amanda will give us really the foundation of why we should create aging friendly communities and really what is the impact of community and older adults. And she'll also talk about her survey of uh, local, of uh, Bay Area local governments and some of the community aging initiatives across the United States. Uh, Jana Lina, AICP, is the Senior Strategic Policy Advisor at AARP, where she works at the P Public Policy Institute and her research focuses on transportation and livable communities. Her most recent research and project management activities resulted in publications entitled Planning Complete Streets for an Aging America, Road Safety for All, Lessons from Western Europe, and Policy Options to Improve Specialized Transportation. Prior to her employment with AARP, she was a Director of Transportation Planning for the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, where she designed and managed a groundbreaking study on the linkage between land use and the mobility of older adults. She also represents ARP on the National Center for Senior Transportation and America Walks Steering Committees, and she serves on the Legislative Committee on the Virginia Chapter of the American Planning Association. And Jana will really focus on some community examples that interface between land use and transportation to try to provide planners with some ideas of what's going on in transit-oriented development, or TODs, complete streets, accessory dwelling units, visitability and universal design, and she also give us some innovations that are occurring in terms of human services transportation. Uh, before turning it over to Amanda, I want to provide you with some very basic federal resources that are available. One is the Aging in Place, it's a cityscape uh, volume 12, and it really focuses on affordable housing and supportive services based on a symposium that was held. Um, creating aging friendly communities by the CDC Healthy Aging Network is a wonderful online interactive conference with the purpose of helping to build capacity for change in regards to creating aging friendly communities. And finally, the Federal Interagency Forum on Aging has a annual publication. The latest is Older Americans 2008 Key Indicators of Well-Being. And what I like about it um, is that it has a number of reports. It reflects over 12 national data uh, systems. It talks about the federal partners that are involved in aging and the websites that are available to support this. 
again, I really want to thank both of our speakers and uh, also do a little plug for the Private Practice Division. And this is the web address for the Private Practice Division. We are also going to be um, taking questions, as Jennifer said, after Jana, our last speaker. I want to thank you very much for, um, for participating today. Let me now transfer uh, the speaker over to um, Amanda. Great. Thank you. Amanda, you're now ready to go. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Ramona. Um, and I am very happy to be participating in this webinar today. Uh, again, my name is Amanda Lenning. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. I'm really bringing um, a, the social work perspective and also the researcher perspective to my presentation today. So what I'm going to talk about is, first I want to talk about the background and significance of this idea of creating more aging-friendly communities. So what do we mean by aging-friendly communities? Uh, why do I think this is important? Um, and what impact could this have on older adults? So what is the research evidence for some of these changes to the physical and social environment? Uh, and then I want to go over a couple examples. First, um, as Ramona mentioned, I did a survey of Bay Area local governments looking at different changes to the physical and social environment. And I'll just present, uh, present a couple results from that survey. And then um, from the more social work perspective, I'm going to present some results of different types of community aging initiatives. They're mostly on the uh, nonprofit side. But, but what else is happening in communities across the country to make them more aging friendly? Um, and I do want to just very quickly acknowledge um, the support I've received for these different projects, including the MetLife Foundation, Hartford Doctoral Fellows Program, HUD, the Society for Social Work and Research, and particularly Andy Starlack at the UC Berkeley School of Social Welfare, who is involved in both of the research projects that I'll be presenting today. So a growing number of international, national, state, and local initiatives have started working to make communities more aging friendly. Um, examples include the World Health Organization's Age Friendly Cities Initiative, the Visiting Nurse Service of New York's Advantage Initiative, N4A and Partners for Livable Communities Aging in Place Initiative, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Community Partnerships for Older Adults. Um, and in my work with Andy Charlack, we defined an aging-friendly community as having five characteristics. Uh, the first is continuity. So individuals can con continue to pursue and enjoy lifelong interests and activities. Uh, the second is compensation. Supports are available to help individuals with disabilities meet their basic health and social needs. Third is challenge. Older adults can develop new sources of fulfillment and engagement. Connection, which are opportunities to develop and maintain meaningful interpersonal relationships. And then contribution, which are opportunities to participate in and have an impact upon the social environment. Changing the physical and social environment to better meet the needs of older adults or making our communities more aging friendly is a potential solution to three interrelated problems, including demographic changes, inadequate long-term care, and the desire to age in place. So first, in terms of demographic changes, um, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the uh, percent and number of people who are 65 and older. So for example, in 1900, about 4.1% or 3.1 million people were 65 and older in the United States. By 2000, this had grown to 13% or 38 million people. And by 2050, this will be 20% or 88 million people. Um, in part, this is being driven by lower fertility rates. For example, in 1800, people had about seven to eight children on average, and that's uh, it's around two today. Uh, this is also driven by the aging of the baby boom generation, the 80 million people born between 1946 and 1964. And then there's also increased longevity. People are living longer than ever before. Uh, right now, average life expectancy is 77, and it's believed it will reach about 87 years by 2050. 
In addition, the need for long-term care assistance is possibly increasing. So the 85 and older population increased by 350% over the past century. And this group is currently the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. Uh, they're, they're expected to grow from 4 million in 2000 to 19 million by 2050. Um, and this is particularly important because the incidence of functional and cognitive impairment increases with age. So for example, people 85 and older have a much higher risk for dementia. And almost half of people 85 and older have difficulty walking compared to about 18% of those between the ages of 65 and 74. Um, we've also seen that baby boomers are showing signs of reversals in improvements in health that we've seen in recent generations of older adults. Uh, so for example, adults who were ages 40 to 59 between 1997 and 2006 showed an increase in obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease compared to adults in this age group in the 1980s and early 1990s. Another problem is long-term care in the United States. So long-term care here is characterized first by unmet needs. So about 30% of older adults with disabilities report an unmet need for assistance. Long-term care is also very expensive. So spending from all public and private sources was an estimated $207 billion in 2007. And then informal family care, caregiving from friends, um, husbands and wives, children, was valued at another $357 billion per year. Uh, in 2008, Maver national average rates for um, a room in a nursing home was almost $200 a day, which is about $70,000 a year. Uh, the average cost of assisted living facilities is a little over $3,000 a month, or $36,000 per year. And then the rate for in-home services varies from between around $18 an hour to up to $46 per hour, depending on the amount of care uh, required. Uh, long-term care also has an institutional bias. So Medicaid accounts for almost 50% of long-term care spending in the U.S. Um, and even with increases in home and community-based services in recent years, about 70% of Medicaid long-term care dollars go to nursing homes. Um, in addition, this past January, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission recommended adding a copay to the home health care benefit because it, uh, as a way to discourage use of this benefit. So this will lead to even more older adults needing to enter a nursing home because they can't access community-based care. Uh, and then finally, long-term care in the United States is of a questionable quality. So for example, according to the Institute of Medicine, about one in six nursing homes have problems in quality of care. And this can result in things like pain, pressure sores, uh, malnutrition, and urinary in incontinence in residents. Um, there's also little oversight over assisted living facilities or home and community-based services. And then while there will always be a need for some form of institutional long-term care, things like nursing homes and assisted living facilities, uh, the majority of people prefer to remain in their own home or community for as long as possible. A recent survey, 93% of adults said they wanted to age in place as long as they could. So moving on to evidence of benefit. Um, in an effort to redu reduce excess disability, potentially prevent or delay the need for institutional care and facilitate aging in place despite age-related functional decline, uh, there is a growing interest in fostering comprehensive changes in physical and social environments of our towns and cities in this country. Um, before giving some specific examples of what is happening right now, I just want to provide an overview of the evidence that changing the physical and social environment can help achieve these goals. So we can think about this in terms of what is called the ecological model of aging. Um, and what this basically proposes is that elements of elder well-being, such as health or aging in place, are based on what's called the competence of the older individual and the environmental press of their situation. So competence is defined as a characteristic of the individual such as biological functioning, motor skills, or cognitive functioning. 
And then environmental press is made up of the characteristics of the physical and social environment that place demands on the individual. So as an individual experiences the declines in health and functioning that often accompany old age, environmental press may exceed confidence, potentially resulting in negative outcomes, such as depression or limited mobility uh, or even institutionalization. So creating more aging-friendly communities involves modifying the environmental press to better match the confidence of older adults. Uh, a growing research literature suggests that specific changes to the physical and social environment can improve the health and well-being of older adults and help them age in place. Uh, in terms of the physical environment, I'm going to focus on modifications within three areas, uh, community design, housing, and transportation mobility. So first, within community design. Uh, empirical studies report a consistent association between aspects of community design, such as mixed-use neighborhoods, higher density development, sidewalk continuity, traffic calming, and improved street lighting, with increased physical activity for individuals of all ages. Uh, while there are a few studies of the relationship between community design and health and well-being in older adults, Studies indicate that mixed-use and walkable neighborhoods are associated with an increase in physical activity, a decrease in disabilities, and fewer symptoms of depression. And this could reflect older adults' ability to remain connected to the community when they can access goods and services within walking distance of their home. In terms of housing, uh, research is fairly limited in the area of housing and elder well-being. Um, for example, it's not yet possible to determine if cities that adopt an accessory dwelling unit ordinance or increase the supply of affordable housing for seniors see a reduction in institutionalization or social isolation in their elderly population. Uh, however, home modifications and environmental adaptations, such as um, housing with wider doorways, sloped entry paths, or grab bars in the shower, uh, are associated with a lower risk of experiencing health problems, slower de decline in functional independence, and a reduction in health care expenses. And then finally, in the area of transportation and mobility, research indicates that older adults who give up driving experience negative effects. So for example, non-drivers make 15% fewer trips for medical appointments and 65% fewer trips for religious, social, or community activities compared to older adults who are still driving. A recent study indicates the negative impact of driving cessation on elder well-being can be avoided if transportation needs are met through other modes of travel, such as public transportation or senior van services. However, about 33% of older adults do not have public transit in their communities, and those who do frequently deal with inadequate public transportation that offers frequent service to destinations targeted at commuters, such as office parks, uh, rather than the elderly, such as medical complexes and senior centers. Six-route bus systems are often viewed as unsafe, unresponsive, inaccessible, and inconvenient to older adults. Uh, and a recent study reported that an inability to use six-route public transit is related to shrinking social network size. Uh, suggesting potential benefits for improving the accessibility of public transit and also providing alternative transportation services. The social environment, including social support, social services, community involvement, and civic engagement, also plays a vital role in elders' ability to age in place. Previous research suggests that social support enhances physical and mental health among older adults, whereas loneliness, social isolation and stressful social relationships contribute to a higher risk of disability, poor recovery from illness, and even mortality. In terms of opportunities for community engagement, uh, formal volunteering, membership in organizations, political participation, and social activities are associated with longer survival rates and lower risks of dementia. Uh, in addition, volunteerism is associated with increased levels of self-rated health and self-efficacy and decreases in functional dependency and depression. And then studies indicate that both out-of-home services, such as adult daycare, rehabilitation services, and senior centers, 
as well as in-home services such as meal delivery programs, uh, companionship programs, or household chore services can positively impact well-being among elders. Uh, for example, adult day health centers are associated with fewer feelings of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. And also, in-home services are associated with improved physical functioning, reduced depressive symptoms, and greater life satisfaction. So moving on to um, some of the research results I wanted to share with you today. So first of all, my dissertation focused on uh, San Francisco Bay Area government looking at um, the adoption of 22 different policies and programs in the areas of community design, housing, transportation, health and supportive services, and opportunities for community engagement. Um, so I collected information through surveys and then some interviews with um, city planners and community development directors, county aging services directors, county transportation planners, and then some higher level public transportation employees. And what I found um, is that the most common policies and programs include those that target alternative forms of transportation. And by that, I mean things like walking and public transit. Um, so including incentives for mixed-use neighborhoods, infrastructure changes to improve the walkability of neighborhoods, discounted public transportation fares, uh, and changes to improve the accessibility of public transportation. Um, as you can see here also, all counties offer traditional aging services and some sort of directory of programs. Um, and all cities offer uh, an accessory dwelling unit or second unit ordinance in my sample, though it should be noted that California state law limits the ability of cities to restrict the development of ADUs, but that's not the case across the country. And then among the least popular policies and programs, um, while almost 60% of cities have made infrastructure changes that could help older drivers remain safely, safely on the road, this could be things like larger road signs or added left-hand turn lanes, um, only a small minority offer driver education programs, driver assessment programs, or have a slower moving vehicle ordinance, like allowing people to operate golf carts on roadways. Uh, and this supports other research that local, state, and federal governments um, has not been giving too much attention to keeping elders behind the wheel. Um, they focus more on the public transportation, alternative transportation side in general. Uh, but older adults want to keep driving for as long as possible, so there's a, a bit of a conflict here. Uh, less than 39% of cities offer developers incentives to incorporate accessibility features, including wider doorways, entrances without steps, uh, and grab bars into new housing. Uh, since the majority of new homes that include visitability provisions have been built in areas where it is legally mandated, it appears that local laws and incentives could lead to the development of more accessible housing. Uh, in addition, it is more cost effective to incorporate accessibility features into new housing than to retrofit existing homes. Uh, many older adults reside in older homes that may require expensive renovations but may not live in communities with adequate housing options if they have any physical limitations that require accessibility features. Uh, and moving on to more of what is happening on the nonprofit um, and private side, uh, working with Andy Sharlick at UC Berkeley, um, through a web-based search, we identified 293 initiatives across the country that are working to create more aging-friendly communities. Um, and 124 completed an online survey for us. So based on these 124, we created five different types of community aging initiatives. And I'll describe these in more detail in the following slides. But um, just very basically, uh, community-wide planning efforts take a top-down governance approach. And they include community-wide needs assessments and strategic planning. Consumer-driven support networks use a more bottom-up governance approach, and they include consumer-driven associations that provide peer support and activities to increase neighborhood social capital. The distinguishing characteristic of the third and fourth types is their collaborative approach as, as opposed to their governance structure. So cross-sector system change 
initiatives collaborate among various stakeholders, typically across existing service delivery sectors. Meanwhile, residence-based support services include collaborations between service providers and geographically defined housing settings. And then finally, single sector services primarily involve new, expanded, or improved access for a specific type of service, for example, transportation, but they're generally not working towards overall system change. And then I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. So community-wide planning initiatives focus primarily on planning and data collection. Uh, funding for these initiatives comes mostly from local governments, so nonprofit organizations and grants also provide substantial financial support. Uh, respondents indicate that older adults are highly involved in these initiatives, but primarily in terms of providing input, so for example, participating in a community needs assessment. Uh, the Advanced Initiative of the Visiting Nurse Service of New York offers one example of this category. The communities across the country participating in the Advantage Initiative receive assistance and guidance in gathering information directly from elder residents, which is then used to inform planning and community education efforts. Initiatives within the consumer-driven support networks category offer peer support networks and services and rarely engage in activities such as data collection or planning or advocacy. Uh, their funding comes primarily from fees such as annual membership dues, um, gifts such as contributions from members or others, and in-kind donations. Most of these initiatives consider themselves to be villages, which are organizations based on Beacon Hill Village, a membership-based association created by a group of seniors living in Boston. Uh, in return for annual dues, village members receive a variety of services and support, including access to core services such as weekly grocery shopping trips. Uh, referrals and discounts to vetted outside services, such as home repair um, or even a beauty salon, and opportunities to develop sources of social support and engagement. Uh, elders are highly involved in the, many of these organizations' activities, including developing the initiative, providing oversight and governance, and offering support and services to other members. So a lot of these are grassroots organizations that were started by older adults themselves. Uh, and to date, about 45 other organizations modeling themselves on the Beacon Hill Village have emerged across the United States. Cross-sector systems change initiatives use inter-organizational collaboration as a method to achieve their goals, which typically include community education and enhancing existing programs, services, and infrastructure for older adults. A large number of initiatives in this group receive grant funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Community Partnership for Older Adults. Uh, CPFOA is a competitive grant program that calls for the formation of partnerships among community stakeholders. Uh, for example, policymakers, older adults, social service providers, and local governments to plan and implement strategies to promote the independence and dignity of older adults. Older adults play a major role in providing input and developing the initiative. Uh, initiatives within the residence-based support services category were primarily naturally occurring retirement communities, or NORCs. Uh, NORCs are residential settings or neighborhoods that were not designed for older adults. They're not like retirement communities, but in which more than 50% of residents are age 60 or older, so they have aged in place. Uh, to meet the needs of these older residents, a community agency will create what's called a NORC Supportive Services Program, or NORC SSP, provide or refer residents to such services as transportation, nutrition programs, and opportunities for socialization. The majority of initiatives in this category aim to provide services or linkages to program participants, as well as promote the involvement of elders in their initiatives. Their focus on service provision can be seen in the large percentage of initiatives that listed older adults as highly involved in receiving services and support. Uh, public funds are the primary source of funding listed by these initiatives. Um, many of them participated in um, the U.S. Uh, Administration on Aging's Demonstration Grant Project that just ended in 2010. 
And then finally, single sector services include initiatives that may provide services, promote elder involvement, or improve community awareness of older adults. Initiatives in this category differ from those in the other categories in terms of their focus on a specific sector, such as transportation, or housing, or arts and culture. Uh, many of these initiatives have participated in the Aging in Place Initiative of Partners for Livable Communities and uh, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Uh, this Aging in Place initiative provided Jumpstart the Conversation grants to organizations and partnerships across the country to develop policies and services to address a specific sector in each community. Uh, the majority of single sector services initiatives list grants or nonprofit organizations as their primary source of funding. Uh, and similar to residence-based support services, single sector services involve adults primarily as recipients of services and support. So thank you so much for listening. Um, you can contact me if you want any more information about these projects. What I presented today is a, a very just skimming the surface of um, the two research projects. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jana. OK, thank you, Amanda. Um, excellent overview and framework for helping us understand aging um, and older adults' needs and how planners and local governments can help to facilitate connecting these older individuals to um, various services and supports to help them age in place. Um, in terms of my presentation today, what I thought I'd do is provide very brief background of some of AARP's activities on livable communities. Um, add a little bit to what Amanda covered in terms of some of the challenges we face with an aging society, and then dive more deeply into some innovations that we see out in communities, just to give some examples of some of the things that Amanda uh, touched upon, and um, uh, some additional examples as well. So with that, let me get started. The, AARP really has a social uh, contract with the 50 plus uh, population, which basically states that we want to support those older Americans to have independence, choice, and control in ways that are beneficial and affordable to them and for society as a whole. And as part of the social impact agenda, we have a program at AARP called Livable Communities. And it is kind of a stepchild to our other well-known work in uh, health care uh, access, as well as social security issues, um, finance issues, et cetera. Um, but there are a number of us at AARP who are working to promote livable communities out there at the federal level, as well as at the state and local levels. AARP defines a livable community as one that is safe and secure, uh, provides affordable and appropriate housing, supportive community features and services, mobility options, and all of these things work together to facilitate personal independence and engagement of residents in civic and social life. So I think our definition of livable communities very much aligns with the five key elements that Amanda talked about in terms of an age-friendly community. In terms of some of our legislative priorities, we've been working in the area of uh, complete streets uh, policy promotion, older driver safety, specialized transportation, and affordable and accessible housing. Much of our work, um, while we do have federal lobbying efforts, uh, much of our work happens more at the local level on livable communities through our state offices. This is a photograph of an example from New York where our volunteers, um, as well as others in the community, went out and did our sidewalks and street surveys to really uh, draw attention to the need for improved infrastructure within the state and our communities. So some of the challenges we confront. Um, one thing that's very important to recognize is that most older adults want to remain in their homes and communities for as long as possible. It's somewhat of a myth that older folks are going to move to the Sun Belt and retire in Florida, Arizona, et cetera. There are certainly you know, hundreds of people who do that, but the great majority of people, uh, somewhere around 85% 
um, and on up remain in their homes and communities throughout their um, older years. And you can see that 90% of those 65 to 74 wish to age in their communities, even higher percentages for those 75 and older. So it's very important that we as planners look to see how we can promote aging in place. Many people uh, know that our disability rates have been declining for the past couple of decades. However, what's less well recognized is that because of the growing numbers of older persons in this country as well as decreasing rates of institutionalization, the numbers of older adults who are living in community with disabilities is on the rise. Uh, so again, the types of services and supports that are going to be necessary to meet their needs are going to be different um, today and as we move forward, much more tailored to meeting the needs of those with um, more mobility constraints, etc. Another challenge is that the majority of U.S. homes are not accessible. Only about 3% of Americans lived in a house with any kind of accessibility feature. Um, even though almost 30% of our families have at least one member with a disability of any age. 65% um, of American uh, homes are single family residents, and these are outside the scope of any federal accessibility laws. Now the recession has hit older adults very hard. If you're 55 and older, among the 2 million who have been unemployed, as of you know, January, on average, you would have been out of work for 10 weeks longer than younger workers. And there are nearly six times as many older adults with unmet housing needs as there are currently served by rent-assisted housing. And from a study that we did back in 2008, we find that nearly 30% of all delinquencies and foreclosures in the current housing crisis uh, were of Americans 50 and older who were having their homes foreclosed upon. So it's not just an issue that's impacted younger adults. In terms of housing cost burden, that is paying more than 30% of your income toward housing costs, you can see that among those 50 and older in the lowest and um, second quartile, uh, nearly universal that these individuals are paying more in housing costs than they really should be paying. Um, the exception to this would be those individuals who are lucky enough to own their homes free and clear. Sprawl really um, exacerbates many of the challenges of aging in place, particularly when it comes to mobility and getting services to individuals. We know that about one in five adults, 65 and older, do not drive. And on average, if you're lucky enough to live until you're 70, you'll outlive your driving years anywhere from 7 to 10 years. So looking to have some transportation options in the community is extremely important. Now another thing uh, that's very important to note is that older persons are our most vulnerable road users. They're about 13% of the total population, but they're involved in about 15% um, of motor vehicle fatalities, um, being the individuals actually killed in these, uh, these crashes, and 19% of pedestrian fatalities. And this is really because as we age, our bodies become more frail, and um, the, the impact of a crash is much more severe, and often uh, folks cannot survive the crash. Older adults also tell us that their roads are inhospitable. 40% uh, say they do not have adequate sidewalks in their neighborhoods, and nearly half say they cannot cross their main road safely. So this really underscores our rationale for putting a lot of energy toward complete streets. And uh, recently, uh, in the last couple of years, we published this document, Planning Complete Streets for an Aging America. And as part of this report, we did an online survey with the Institute of uh, Transportation Engineers and had more than a thousand planners and engineers respond to this survey and found that two-thirds of those individuals reported that they had not yet considered the needs of older users in their multimodal planning. 
We also worked with the National Complete Streets Coalition to evaluate the 80 Complete Streets policies that had been adopted by the end of 2008 and found that less than a third of those policies explicitly address the needs of older road users, even though they're the most vulnerable users. Another challenge when we look at providing uh, transit services to older adults is the very high cost of providing ADA paratransit service. And just because you're older and frail does not mean you qualify for ADA paratransit service. Um, and we're seeing that many communities, because of these rising costs, are scaling back their um, eligibility for services and really tightening that eligibility up so that only those with um, qualifying disabilities would receive this type of specialized service. And you can see the reasons why. Um, on average in the United States, a uh, one-way trip on ADA paratransit costs about $30. And even though less than 1% of the total system ridership, it accounts for about 8.5% of the total operating costs. So uh, we all need to be looking for other means to provide public transportation to people who um, need a more um, robust form of service other than ADA paratransit service. Another uh, challenge within the specialized transportation arena is that we have numerous federal and state agencies, local agencies that provide funding for uh, transportation services. They all bring their own requirements for eligibility, for reporting, administrative uh, hurdles, et cetera. And what often happens out there in the community is that an older adult or a person with a disability is unable to really figure out where to go for that um, transportation service. So now let me turn over to talking a bit about some of the innovations that are happening in our communities. And starting with uh, transit-oriented development. Now, of course, this is not a new concept for planners. And what I wanted to feature here is just how some of the evidence for uh, the ways that transit-oriented development specifically benefits older adults. And I take this from my own research with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, where we did a study back in the 2005-2006 timeframe to understand the transportation needs of older adults throughout Northern Virginia. And as part of this study, we did a series of focus groups um, with residents from different types of communities throughout Northern Virginia. And I recall one gentleman who talked about being diagnosed with macular degeneration and how he felt his life was over because he had to give up driving. But then he moved to Arlington and to one of the transit-oriented development uh, neighborhoods and senior living facilities, and he was able to walk to, you know, within a three to five block walk of the metro rail system, the numerous bus routes, an indoor shopping mall, grocery store, public park, library, high school with a swimming pool, banks, churches, etc., and really found that his quality of life was quite good even after he gave up driving. Now for the transportation planners who may be listening in, we also did a, a telephone survey. This was a randomized scientific survey with, I believe, more than like 1,500 responses and divided all of those responses uh, that we received from those 75 and older in the, throughout Northern Virginia by community type and found that those who were living in these walkable mixed-use TOD or historic downtown neighborhoods were much more likely to have gone out the previous day. They were on average taking 20% more trips per week. And this could indicate that these type of communities are good at helping folks avoid some of the social isolation that too often comes with aging. But in terms of some of the other measures, we looked at the share of trips and found that those folks living in these urban, walkable, um, mixed-use areas were about 4% of their total trips were on fixed route public transportation. 
And while that sounds fairly low, it actually is um, much higher than the national average, even for urban areas, and really um, shows that the, the trend of declining transit ridership among the older population in the United States that we've seen for the last couple of decades um, was not being seen in these type of communities in Northern Virginia. But perhaps more significantly, we found that 22% of all of their trips were on foot. They're really taking advantage of the proximity to these various services uh, in the community. Their share of trips were uh, less, by driving themselves, were less, about 50% compared to two-thirds of all trips by those uh, individuals living in suburban and exurban areas. Uh, and we generally associate transit-oriented development with urban areas, but the same type of principles can be applied to rural areas as well with uh, successful transit-oriented development. And one state that has done a really great job in planning for transit-oriented development in rural areas is the state of Washington. And this is an example from Walla Walla. And this transit center, which is in the heart of the downtown area, links six different transit services, a couple of local, town, and county public transportation services, a tribal transit system, Greyhound, and the state's inner city, uh, one of the state's inner city bus routes. During the weekdays, the park and ride lot is, you know, for commuters, but on the weekends it opens up to a farmer's market. It really provides a nice central gathering space for the community to, you know, pick up fresh fruits and vegetables, et cetera. And all of this is part of a larger system of inner city uh, bus network where the state has gone in and using federal 5311F funding has helped to put back in place some of the bus service that was taken out by Greyhound beginning in the 1980s, a trend that we've seen all over the country. And they've done this to, in, along with uh, looking at planning for transit-oriented development in some of these um, intermodal hubs. So, in, and have done an excellent job of connecting local public transport, transit services with ferry services, airports, um, rail stations, etc. And there's one story I remember uh, the state transit planner talking about how when they opened up one of their new inner city lines, the first people in line were an elderly couple who said, we just can't wait to get on the bus because now we get to go visit our grandchildren and we don't have to wait for them to come visit us. AARP has done some work in transit-oriented development. We certainly have policy that supports this type of mixed-use planning and put out this document um, a couple of years ago on preserving affordability and access in livable communities and did this in conjunction with Reconnecting America and the National Housing Trust. And in terms of the policy recommendations uh, coming out of the report, one is the need to preserve the existing um, and create new affordable housing in these ad advantageous locations. About um, more than half of all federally assisted housing units have at least re one resident age 50 and older. And we can see from the Northern Virginia example that transit-oriented areas are very beneficial to older adults, but we need, especially those of more limited income, but we need to make sure that we're pre preserving these subsidized units in these locations. Um, the se Section 8 program, Section 202 program that builds uh, affordable housing for older adults and a couple of the other programs as well. We want to make sure we integrate transportation and land use policy with housing policy and direct investments uh, in transportation to improve station areas, the accessibility, make sure that our streets and sidewalk network provides safe access to those station areas that older adults can take advantage of. Now, in addition to federal um, affordable housing policy and programs, at the local level, uh, Amanda touched upon this, the accessory dwelling unit ordinances, uh, California really being a leader in this regard, uh, Santa Cruz offering a national model. 
And accessory dwelling units, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the term, basically it's a separate residence that's associated with a single family zoning district. It could be attached to the main house, within the main house, or a detached unit. It's considered affordable housing uh, in that it allows someone um, to rent a unit for additional income, helps an older couple or an older individual to have some additional income in order to, to remain in their home, or that an older couple could rent a small unit from uh, someone in the, the community um, or live in a unit that's um, in, say, their children's home as well. So Santa Cruz won a 2005 APA award. They've developed seven 500-square-foot uh, prototypes, and homeowners who choose one of these prototypes, they get through an expedited review process. Those homeowners that price rents at affordable rates qualify for financial assistance and some fee waivers, et cetera. In my own community of Arlington, Virginia, back in 2008, Arlington passed an accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Uh, Arlington now allow, allows accessory dwelling units by right within the home and by use permit for detached units. And this was actually extremely controversial within the community. Lots of editorials over a many month period going back and forth about the pros and cons of accessory dwelling units with you know, many in the community feeling their single family home zoning districts under threat. Um, one of the issues was parking and the way Arlington dealt with that is to say that 60, if, if the parking on the block where the 80 units proposed is uh, parked at 65 percent or more, then the homeowner would need to provide one space off, um, off of off-street parking in order to um, accommodate the additional residents. Accessibility within the home is a very important issue and needs to be addressed and uh, additional publication that we released back in 2008 is this one on visitability and visitability is basic access to the home so that if someone in a wheelchair could visit you in your home with in a comfortable sort of way com comfort and safety and it includes one zero step entrance located either at the front, back, or side of the house, a 32-inch clearing, clear opening at doorways, accessible circulation throughout, and at least a half bath on the main floor. So it's not considered to be a permanent solution for um, prolonged disability, but at least um, allows someone to visit your home or allows you, if you develop a disability, to at least temporarily not have to move or spend an, an exorbitant amount of money to retrofit your home just to stay there. And really, visibility um, can be done uh, through the site planning process and design process with any type of unit, whether it be your live, work, townhouse units, more of the cottage townhouse style, or suburban single family home type of units. The greatest number of visibility uh, properties that have been built have come from mandatory ordinances where developers, builders are required to, to put in uh, visitability features. And the most well known are from Pima County, Arizona, San Antonio, Texas, Bolingbroke, Illinois. Now I'd like to transition over to um, some of the transportation solutions, innovations, uh, complete streets. Again, I mentioned that AERP has done a fair amount of work in this area. We see complete streets as absolutely essential for um, providing um, access in, in a safe and convenient way for people who travel not only by car, but by foot, bicycle, and transit, really regardless of age and ability. And I want to run through these slides very quickly, but I think it is important just to um, sh describe what Complete Streets um, policies try to accomplish. And basically, 
it's to make sure that the entire right-of-way is planned, designed, operated, maintained to provide safe access for all users. What we're trying to do with the passage of complete streets policies is move away from everyday uh, transportation planning and design practices, move away from the project by project fight for additional accommodations to really institutionalizing the planning process that is accommodating to all users. Trying to go after a network of roads where some roads in the community will um, slow vehicle speeds and give priority to pedestrians and bicyclists. Other roads in the community maybe um, give more priority to larger vehicles such as buses and trucks, but still provide the basic accommodations for pedestrian safety, bicycle safety. We're not looking for a new pot of funding, but looking to shift how we spend our transportation dollars today. Because we know that going back and retrofitting the streets actually costs more money than just doing it right the first time. And a complete streets policy also helps to provide support to those transportation planners, elected officials, other community leaders for doing things a bit differently. So complete streets policies, they're not a mandate for an immediate retrofit. It's as you would be doing work on your roads anyway to take a new approach to their planning and design. It's not a silver bullet. Complete streets does not deal with land use, which we know has a lot of impact on transportation. And it's not a design prescription. There's no single complete streets cross section. It really depends on the land use and uh, transportation environment in the community. At this point, there are over 200 communities that have adopted complete streets policies across the country. You can see in 2009, there was something like uh, 48 policies adopted, and just last year, 78 policies adopted. So the movement is really taking off. Now, I mentioned that we published Planning Complete Streets for an Aging America. And just as an example of what you might find in this publication, We've tried to provide some examples of how you balance the different needs of road users. So for instance, the Federal Highway Administration recommends a 25-foot curb radius for older drivers who have a tendency to turn too sharp and hit the curb or turn too wide into a neighboring lane of traffic. But the larger your curb radius, the faster other drivers tend to take the, the corner, but you can maintain that same effective curve radius by adding parallel parking and bike lanes. So you really can accommodate um, additional users of the system at the same time that you accommodate the older driver. So moving on to public transportation um, and human services transportation, Safety Lou mandated uh, development of locally uh, developed coordinated public transit and human services transportation plans in order for communities to gain access to their Section 5310, which is the elderly and disabled funding stream for public transportation FTA program, the uh, job access reverse commute program, and the new freedom program. Uh, these are plans that typically aren't plans for coordination, but a plan using a coordinated process. But ultimately, the goal is for more coordinated services in the community. The Trans Transit Cooperative Research Program documented some of the benefits uh, valued at around $700 million per year for coordinated uh, human services uh, transportation and transit services. And it, it makes economic sense to not send two vehicles to the same neighborhood at the same time to transport clients from two different agencies, but instead really try to have a, a centralized type of system so that to the extent that the needs of those individuals can be met jointly, that you just send one vehicle and serve them both at the same time. There are other benefits um, offered from coordination, improved um, service quality, um, larger service areas, more um, 
accurate reporting of costs and outputs so that it makes it easier to write grant proposals and really show what the value of your transportation services are. And one of my favorite examples of coordinated transportation is from the Portland, uh, Oregon area, Ride Connection, which is a not-for-profit organization, but which works closely with TriMet, the region's transit provider and um, planning organization. And Ride Connection uh, has this vision to create independence and community connections through the gift of mobility. And they do this by... Um, offering door-to-door -door, uh, trips on their vans for persons uh, with disabilities and older adults or through volunteer driver programs. They have a centralized dispatching system so that individuals call in and they can uh, work with them and determine which type of service they, that would best meet their needs. They work with um, something like around 30 different uh, government agencies, human service agencies, and nonprofit organizations that also provide transportation and, and help them uh, provide that transportation. Again, for people who have fairly severe disabilities who need to use more of the paratransit vehicle uh, versus a volunteer driver program, they're able to, to match the individual to the, to the need very well. And they also have some other uh, innovative ways to um, coordinate services and support um, the community as a whole. Um, for instance, when Ride Connections vans are not in use, they will loan them out to other nonprofit organizations in the community who uh, say a church who will use the, a van on Sunday to pick up parishioners and take them to Mass. Um, and they also uh, have a program where they will sell their retired vehicles at fairly low cost to other nonprofit and government agencies to get you know, the full use out of the vehicle before it's, it's finally retired. One term um, that is very common in the human services transportation, specialized transportation arena uh, that it has the potential to overlap with the planning community is what's termed mobility management. And mobility management is really a catch-all term. It can take many different forms. Um, but under the Section 5310 New Freedom and Dark programs, FTA's um, eligibility rules allow um, mobility management to be treated as a capital expense, which allows um, a funding match of 80% as opposed to the, the typical 50% funding match for uh, operations. And there are many communities, states out there that are using this, this funding to create mobility management programs, hire mobility managers. So, so they, again, they take many forms. Uh, one of these is policy where they may, a mobility manager may be a point person in helping to develop the coordinated human services public transportation plan, develop local partnerships, um, not only you know, help to bridge the public sector with the private sector, nonprofit sector, address some of the institutional issues. This could be land use issues um, that could help to support public transportation. Maybe more of the operational service broker model where there's a centralized dispatch, um, referral, um, scheduling system. They may directly provide rides. Or it could take more of the form of the customer travel agent, um, more of the social worker type of form, working with directly with caseworkers, with clients to do travel training, teaching them how to, to use public transportation, developing individualized trip plans. So that really concludes my presentation. For any of the publications I mentioned through the Public Policy Institute, you can access those through our website, aarp.org forward slash PPI for the Public Policy Institute forward slash live-com for livable communities. And one other resource that we de developed in conjunction um, with the Center for Housing Policy is this toolkit um, for uh, older adults' housing needs, and that is available th from housingpolicy.org. And this is really for anyone working in housing, this is an excellent resource to, 
to access additional resources, not only on housing issues for older adults, but affordable housing issues at large. So with that, I will turn it back over to Ramona, who will help facilitate our question period. Thank you very much, Jana, and thank you, Amanda. Um, we have some interesting questions that came in. Um, first of all, Jana, um, uh, someone wants you to clarify your comment and data concerning the elderly outliving their driving ability. Um, the person couldn't understand your slide or your comment. OK, I, I apologize for that. Um, what I mean by that is that at the end of the typical person's lifespan, if one lives to the age of 70, you will give up your driving um, and not drive for the last 7 to 10 years of your life. So hopefully that is a little clear. OK. Um, someone talks about how aging in place has become a new buzzword, which we can agree on. One reason is because it is theoretically cheaper. Um, how will we ever regulate such a decentralized system of care like nursing facilities or are these institutions grossly overregulated? Um, John or Amanda, Amanda, either one? Uh, well, this is Amanda. Um, I mean, I can, in terms of the, the second half of the question, um, I, I don't think nursing homes are overly regulated. Having worked in a nursing home for a while as a social worker, um, they have annual state visits and they go through the medical records, but I wouldn't say that they are overly self-regulated. Can you, can you repeat the beginning of the question, Ramona? Yeah. Um, the question is really, um, we do know that it's cheaper to do aging in place, but how, how can you uh, regulate all these nursing facilities that keep coming up? and um, because there's so many different issues that you have to regulate, and even now there's issues in regards to um, health happiness, you know, those sort of things. Uh, so how do you put your arms around regulating if aging in place is the goal and you need nursing okay. homes? Okay. Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we will always need nursing homes for um, a select part of the elderly population, you know, people who don't have family members to help out, people who have uh, severe functional or cognitive limitations. Um, as far as aging in place initiatives go, I'm not entirely sure that aging in place initiatives are the cheaper alternative, even though, for example, providing um, care to somebody in their home might be cheaper on a daily basis, um, you know, compared to, you know, say paying $20, $25 an hour compared to $200 a day when you're in a 24-hour facility. Um, I think aging in place depends on significant um, resources being invested in things like what uh, Dana and I were talking about in terms of changing the infrastructure, changing the housing options, um, improving the range of home and community-based services available to people. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but just addressing the fact that I think it's, it's not, just a, not just a buzzword like aging in place and we'll put it all on the family's shoulders, um, which tends to be happening in the long-term care system anyway but it requires a significant amount of resources invested in creating communities where older adults can continue to live for as long as possible. Jana, do you want to add anything to that in regards to the coordination that you saw in some of those community examples? Yeah, I just, I'd like to add um, that based on my colleagues' um, research here at the Public Policy Institute, it is, <laughs> What we have found is the cost of providing um, support services to help people age in their own homes and, and communities is like a third the cost of what um, Medicaid, for instance, would pay to put someone in a nursing home. So I, I do think that there are a lot of opportunities to provide these types of supports, but we have to look at 
you know, the different funding streams and make sure that, the, that we are able to put some of this money to, toward um, providing home and community-based services. And, and, you know, unfortunately, when the recession hits, we see quite a number of places that cut back on things like transportation services for older adults um, instead of looking at the long-term bigger picture that ultimately it may be cheaper to keep people in their homes and provide that, that transportation service. But those budgets are coming from different pots of money and, and so it doesn't always um, get looked at in that way. But I also wanted to add for the, the question on the regulation of nursing home facilities. I'm certainly not an expert in that in any regard, particularly in terms of what goes on inside the nursing home, but at the land use planning um, level, I think planners do um, play a very important role, and there's a new model or new models out there, for instance, something called the green homes that is uh, provides the type of services that would be provided in a nursing home, but it does that in a manner that's um, much more integrated into the community and that it feels much more like a home to the individual living there. But they, folks trying to build the green home models have run into some of the, the land use uh, barriers, um, building code barriers to actually putting these things in place. So it's being aware of those types of things and in some ways to reduce the barrier to having a more innovative type of um, institutional care become available in the community. Um, you mentioned the whole thing about the elderly drivers. In, in aging in place, should we be providing more support for this kind of assistance, or rather, how can we provide more support for elderly drivers? Well, I think there's, there's a couple of, of different approaches. Um, one is through the actual road design, and in a longer Complete Streets presentation, I would talk about how we design Complete Streets for older drivers. It's things like investing in um, larger fonts on signs, on retroreflective sign materials, pavement marking, making sure the edge lines of our highways are, are wide and retroreflective um, to help people with aging eyesight navigate that system using um, paint to paint the, the arrows on the center of the lane for turn movements, um, et cetera. And so there, there's a number of things within um, the engineering realm that can be done. The Federal Highway Administration is currently undergoing an update to their highway design guidelines for older drivers and pedestrians. And that document, the earlier version of that, is in part um, critiqued in our planning, Complete Streets for an Aging America, and we offer some recommendations for that update. And it's to be seen how those recommendations are addressed. But um, you know, that's certainly one way. Um, then with respect on some, you know, some of the other um, a aspects of driving, I think we, we do need to be careful of how we talk about this. For the most part, older drivers are very safe drivers. There's evidence from a recent study from I IIHS, the insurance institution, that shows that crash rates have declined more rapidly for the oldest drivers than they have for younger drivers over the past um, number of years. Um, and you know, when it is time to give up the car keys, we need those transportation options in the community so that it doesn't become uh, the, the life and death decision that it too often does become for many older persons. Uh, some, while we're talking about the mobility um, question, someone said that one of your slides talks about the slow moving vehicle ordinance. What is it? Slow moving vehicle ordinance? Or, yeah. I you don't remember that? that. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, talk about uh, examples of mixed income independent living senior housing communities in small and mid-sized cities. Are there any examples that fits that? And for example, when you talk about Santa Cruz and Virginia, 
Uh, is enforcement been an issue for an ADU in Santa Cruz and Virginia? And uh, possibly because of the easily the transition, the ability to use that uh, for other accommodations for other than the, just the elderly. If and if are there any incentives or disincentives for building an ADU in these types of communities? So, Ramona, I'm going to jump in and offer clarification. We had a number of astute audience members that knew exactly what the slow-moving um, vehicle, talking about the golf carts. So there was some discussion of golf carts on the streets and potential ordinances associated with those. Perfect. Yeah, that, that was from my presentation. This is Amanda. Ah, is wonderful, team. Amanda. Great. That's perfect. Okay, so let's get back to the question. Um, Jana, did you have any comment about that in regard to ADU and uh, enforcement issues and possibly using that same ADU unit for accommodations for other than the elderly, which is always a challenge in these types of situations? Well, to my knowledge, uh, both Santa Cruz and Arlington do allow those ADU units it's to be used for, you know, to house younger persons as well. So there's not a limitation by age, to my, to my knowledge. I haven't heard about um, enforcement issues. I know that that was a big issue um, as part of the debate when Arlington County was considering an ADU ordinance. I, since the board adopted that policy in 2008, that issue just it seems to have gone away. You know, I'm not inside the government agencies, so I don't know if they're getting still a lot of comments, but it's not in the press any longer. And possibly in part that, that ordinance to address um, some of the community's concerns put a limit of 28 units per year that would be approved as, as part of the ordinance. But I, I can't speak specifically to um, enforcement. Um, I do know that in the literature for Arlington County, they've said that they're going to really, um, because they've passed this policy, now they're going to, if they catch someone having an illegal unit, they're going to really use a, a much harder stick than they otherwise may have um, in order to encourage people to go through the, the process to get a, an approval from the county board and, and um, county government. You know, I uh, let let me ask this question then. Uh, are there any uh, examples of communities where public resistance to mixed-use rezoning within largely low-density residential areas have been won over because of the argument to provide aging in place? Has aging in place been used as an argument against NIMBYism? I'm trying to think of any examples. Um, I can't think of specific examples, but I think that it probably could be a strong argument. We've seen uh, that within the Complete Streets movement to adopt policies, AARP's voice at the table um, talking about the needs of older persons has a tendency to change that debate from one of just accommodating the bicycling community and and young people who want to use more active transportation to a much larger um, community dialogue on some of the larger issues and how our road infrastructure impacts all of us. So I would only imagine that by bringing that forward, it would help to um, make some strong arguments for mixed-use development as well. I think uh, this last question will probably bring both Amanda and Jana in a closing discussion. Um, the question is, with the recession, state and local funds are decreasing. What do each of you think are the cost-effective strategies to enable aging in place based on this environment? Um, this is Amanda. Um, if, I, if we could just go back to the previous question very quickly. Um, okay. Part of my for the, for the NIMBY resistance, um, part of my dissertation, I did interview um, a select group of, of city planners that agreed to talk to me for about an hour on the telephone. And um, several of them mentioned um, that there was a significant amount of public resistance to things like mixed-use neighborhoods or large um, senior housing centers or things like that, and that the concern was usually around 
parking. I mean, especially in the Bay Area, like if you're talking about a city in San Francisco where parking's at a premium. Um, so I did just want to mention that that did come up in my interviews, um, and that really the public resistance is only around things like mixed use, as far as the people I spoke to. So, you know, in general, the public supports you know providing additional supports for older adults, but but when you talk about you know increasing the density in their own neighborhood, there is some resistance to that. Thank you, Amanda. So shall we look at that the last question, the idea about what each of you would recommend or suggest as cost-effective strategies based on the fiscal crisis that states and local governments are going through at currently, and as well as having the baby boomers age in place? Uh, sure, I guess I can um, try to answer that question. I think there are a number of solutions that are really low cost to no cost to the, the public sector, for instance, within complete streets and accommodating older pedestrians. It doesn't cost a lot of money to go out and change the signal timing uh, to provide folks more time to get across the intersection and the crosswalk. Um, it is something that's now required by the MUTCD, uh, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, but it certainly wouldn't hurt to put that in place ahead of schedule, which I think the requirement is for 2014. I think other uh, policies, policy adoption, um, regulatory uh, adoption that involves the private sector in implementation, such as the ADU um, ordinance or a visitability ordinance, um, it, of course it costs some money to do the research to to in the public process and to, to get support for that and, and to do the planning around that. Um, but the, the actual implementation down the road doesn't necessarily cost money. Um, in terms of transportation services, I think um, within specialized transportation, there's probably a need in most communities to reach out to the private sector and try to find some partnerships like Ride Connection has done in Portland, Oregon, or um, trying to think of other communities where they've gotten uh, you know, sponsorships for, uh, from the private sector to make donations to volunteer driver programs. These don't have to be government-based by any means. Um, but look more to the, the charitable giving components and, and raise awareness of the need for, a, you know, an aging community and some of their transportation needs, et cetera. Thanks, John. Amanda? Um, yeah, a, a couple of things, again, that came out of the, the interviews that I did for my dissertation. Um, first of all, at least in the Bay Area, particularly in the more um, suburban communities, um, there was this general perception that there are economic benefits that, you know, a lot of these um, policies and programs and infrastructure changes that we're talking about are not only going to improve the well-being of older adults, but can improve the well-being of all residents or the city as a whole. So, for example, um, several cities had made adjustments or investments in their downtown areas, um, providing incentives for missing mixed-use development, um, you know, trying to make more walkable areas because they saw that as a way to revitalize their downtown district and bring in more um, stores, more services, more uh, job opportunities for their residents. Um, another thing I do want to mention, too, is that um, when I talked about these community aging initiatives, um, a lot of the grants that came from foundations, um, such as the Robert Wood Johnson Community Partnerships for Older Adults, those were given directly to uh, local government to um, develop partnerships to make infrastructure changes. So, for example, in California, the city of Fremont received um, a significant amount of money from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to improve the services that they provide directly to older adults and coordinate them and also to focus specifically on um, culturally competent um, services to older adults. So um, understanding and learning more about these foundation programs and also these nonprofit organizations across the country, I think there's a lot of 
partnership opportunities or opportunities to receive additional funding to create more aging friendly communities. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Jana. Um, I really want to thank you for participating today and for sharing your knowledge. Jennifer? Yes, thank you all very much for joining us. I really learned a lot today. For our attendees, on your way out, you will be filling, asked to fill out an evaluation form. We ask that you do that for us. For our speakers, I will be following up with you and letting you know um, what the evaluations say so you can expect to receive an email from me. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I hope that you'll, we'll see you in future webcast. Thank you. Okay, Ramona, Amanda, and uh, Jana, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and close out, and um, I will just chat with you via email.